Section 6, uh, we're going to begin to talk about what's known as the fundamental theorem of algebra. Now, um, I alluded to kind of what we were going to do in this section a little bit in Section 5. And uh, really what it is is it's a continuation of what we talked about as far as kind of finding roots um, of different types of polynomial equations. And being able to identify where they are um, using graphs uh, and then kind of being able to use those graphs to help narrow down the synthetic division process and and work your way down to something that you might actually be able to factor uh, without having to use uh, such complicated means all right um, really more or less if you're going to get anything out of algebra 2 uh, the fundamental theorem of algebra is one of those main kind of sticking points that you want to make sure that you understand uh, because it's, it's really going to take everything that we've done uh, to this point in the year, not just the semester, but in the year, and kind of put it all into context and help you kind of understand why we've been doing what we've been doing uh, up to this point. Okay, so uh, objectives here, we're going to use the fundamental theorem of algebra uh, to be able to write polyn polynomial equations uh, based on the roots that we're given. Okay? And then we're also going to be able to identify the roots of a polynomial equation kind of using that fundamental theorem of algebra. So we're kind of going to be working things in two separate ways here as we move forward. Okay? Now, again, a lot of this stuff up here on the board should make some sense because it's all stuff that we've talked about at some point in time uh, since the beginning of the school year. Okay, when we've been factoring using quadratics and now that we've started using polynomial functions, all right, all of this more or less means the same thing. All right, it's just uh, written and maybe explained in a little bit different way. Okay, now something I want you to keep in mind as you're going through this particular lesson uh, is kind of like the last one. All right, there's only 14 slides to this particular presentation, we're already on number three. Um, but as we get into the problems, the problems tend to take a little bit of time. There's not really that many. But some of the problems, especially towards the latter part of the video, they're going to take a little bit more time to do. So, you know, if you get to a point here where, um, and I'll kind of help you out a little bit, where you feel like it would be a good point to take a break and maybe work on, you know, your assignment dealing with the problems up to that point in the video and then kind of come back later and take a look at the rest of it, maybe that would be a good idea to help break things up into pieces a little bit. Okay, so just looking at this particular um, chart, okay, which is something that you're going to need to put on your, you should have on your notes somewhere, all right, is like I said, all six of these statements are basically saying the same thing. Everything that we've talked about so far. If you're going to factor a polynomial, you set it equal to zero, okay? The numbers that you get for your intercepts, um, your zeros or your roots, whatever you want to call them, represent the values that make that polynomial equation equal zero. Okay, so when we're looking at a graph, it would be where your graph crosses the x-axis or where the graph has a value, more or less a y value, of zero. Okay, uh, when we talked about synthetic division, you know, roots, if something is a root of a polynomial, it's because your synthetic division shows you that you get a remainder of zero. Okay. Anytime you factor something, okay, if you actually get it to factor out and you set those factors equal to zero and solve, okay, what you're solving for would be your roots or your intercepts um, or your zeros of that particular equation. Okay. And again, if you were to take those zeros and go ahead and fill them back into the equation, all right, to check, all right, when you fill them into your original equation or your original function, your function should equal zero after you evaluate it. Okay, because that's the whole idea of why we call them zeros in the first place. All right. Now, what we're going to start with is um, this is actually similar to something we did when we first started working with quadratics. Um, is we're going to be given roots, and what you're going to do is you're going to write the simplest form of a polynomial that's actually um, the result of having those roots, or that could give you those roots. Now, there's a couple different ways that we could do this. All right. And I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of talk about both, but I think one might be a little bit a little bit easier, or at least eliminate some some confusion as far as fraction goes. Now, if you look at these three numbers up here that are your roots, okay, remember if it was a root, that means you solved your factor or set your factor equal to zero 
to find that root. So if I have a root of negative 1, that means I had a factor of x plus 1. Because if you set x plus 1 equal to 0, you end up getting x equals negative 1, right, which is what we have over here. Now I'll come back to the 2 thirds in a second. I'm going to focus on the 4 first. So the 4, all right, that means you would have had to have had a factor of x minus 4. All right, now, the fraction. There's a couple different ways you can do this, okay? And it's up to you. Uh, I know the book that I pull this stuff out of, what they do is they write that factor as just x minus 2 thirds, like this, okay? Which, it is one way you can do it. Um, I kind of think it's the easy way out uh, as far as really understanding what's going on here. Now, eventually, if you're going to have to find the polynomial, you're going to have to FOIL and distribute and do all that stuff to get back to something that would have been your original. So what I would prefer you do is realize that if you get two-thirds as a root, okay, that means that at some point you had to have had 3x minus 2 as your actual factor. Because, again, think about it. If you set this equal to 0, that would involve adding 2 and then dividing by 3, all right, which would get you to the 2 thirds. Now, it's not that you can't use this up here, because essentially it will get you to the same answer. Okay, or I shouldn't say the same answer. It won't get you to the exact same answer. But it will do, what it will do, is it will get you to something um, that probably has fractions, and you're going to have to distribute fractions and do all that stuff throughout. Okay, as opposed to if you use the 3x minus 2, it might be a little bit easier as you go through um, your distributing and your foiling and your multiplying uh, because you won't end up having to multiply a fraction through everything. So I'm going to do this way first, uh, and I can go back and I can go ahead and put you know, the x minus 2 thirds in this spot later just to kind of show you how they're going to vary a little bit. Okay, but I would prefer you try to do it this way and understand that when you have fractions that are, oops, when you have fractions, fractions that are roots, okay, you end up with fractions as roots by having factors that look like this, where you essentially have something in front of the x. Okay, well I'm going to go ahead and I'm actually going to foil the back part here. So this is going to give me 3x squared. This would give me negative 2x. This would give me negative 12x. We're looking at negative 14x. All right, and here you're going to get plus 8. Okay, now I have the x plus 1, and I have to go ahead and basically I just distribute both parts of that to the second um, polynomial, or the quadratic, I guess you could say. So that's going to give me 3x to the third. A minus 14x squared. That's going to give you plus 8x. Okay, this is going to give me plus 3x squared. All right, this is going to give me minus 14x, and this is going to give me plus 8. Okay, so now we just have to do a little bit of combining. So 3x to the third. Um, let me cross that out as I go. I have negative 14x squared plus 3x squared, so that's going to be negative 11x squared. So that takes care of this and this. All right, 8x minus 14x gives me negative 6x. So we're done there, and plus 8 on the end. So this down here would be what you would get if you go ahead and you know do all the work that we just did and that represents the polynomial that would have roots of negative one two-thirds and four okay now like I said had we used this x minus two-thirds in place of this um, you're gonna get an answer that's a little bit different uh, and it's gonna have fractions in it it doesn't mean that it's not necessarily the same thing uh, it just means that in order to kind of show that it would have be exactly the same as this, you're probably going to end up having to multiply it by a constant to get rid of some of your fractions. So, you know, I could take a look at this, I guess, if we really wanted to. 
Uh, let me go ahead and check my. I'll erase all that stuff and I'll kind of start over here again. Okay, so I will say again, those two factors are going to stay consistent. All right, I'm going to have x plus 1 and I'm going to have x minus 4. But say this time around I go x minus 2 thirds. Okay, in the back. Now I'm going to save that one for last. So I'm going to foil the front part this time first. So x squared uh, minus 4x plus x is going to be minus 3x. Okay, and then minus 4. All right, and then I'll have this x minus 2 thirds back here. All right, now I'm going to go ahead and do the same thing. I'm going to distribute. This is kind of going to look backwards because I have the binomial in the back, but we'll just go ahead and work forward. So that's going to give me x to the third minus 3x squared, okay, and minus 4x. Okay, now when we do the whole, we distribute the negative 2 thirds of everything. It's not so much of a deal right here. Right, when you take negative two thirds times negative three x, all right, you're looking at getting what a negative six over three x. Excuse me, it'd be positive because they're both negative. Okay, so six over three, which that's not going to end up being a huge issue because six divided by three is going to give you two. All right, and then if we go ahead and do this. Uh, negative 4 times negative 2 would give you 8, so that's going to be like plus 8 over 3. Okay, now again, we said this is basically just going to be 2x, so that makes things a little bit easier. But you can see now how when you go through this, you know, x to the third is okay here, but now I have to start combining like this stuff here. All right, and technically, you know, you would get negative 3 and 2 thirds. But instead of writing mixed numbers, if you have negative 3 and 2 thirds, technically that would be, what, negative 9 plus 2 would be, so 9 plus 2 would be 11 over 3. So technically like negative 11 over 3x squared. Okay, and this will make sense when I get to the very end here uh, as far as how we can clean this up. So that takes care of that. On my x's, I have negative 4x plus 2x, so negative 2x, and then I have plus 8 over 3. Now, if you look at that answer down here, initially it looks different than what we just had. All right, but technically it's the same thing because what I could do to eliminate all the fractions is if I take this whole thing times 3, okay, and I'll go ahead and do that. I will actually get 3x to the third. All right, this 3 cancels out this 3 on the bottom. All right, so I end up with negative 11x squared. Okay, uh, 3 times negative 2x would be negative 6x. And if I take 3 uh, times 8 thirds, the 3s cancel, so I end up with a plus 8 at the end. Okay, now this should look exactly like the answer we got the first time that we did it. So you can see that they are the exact same polynomial, but when you start using things in fractions that look like this, um, it can be a little bit more confusing because you have to multiply fractions. Uh, and then at the same time at the end, um, if you want to get rid of those fractions, you end up having to figure out, okay, what number here would essentially cancel out my denominators uh, or would be the same thing as my denominators all the way through and in certain points that can become a little bit complicated because you might not always have the same denominator in the bottom of all your fractions okay so like I said before uh, the first method for doing this would probably be the easiest way to do it um, because you eliminate some of that fraction stuff but if you were to do it this way what I originally have boxed up on the bottom before I multiplied by 3 that would be an acceptable answer it's just a matter of whether you want to deal with fractions or not. Okay, the multiplication of the 3 here that I did, that's simply just to show you that this answer down here is pretty much the same thing as that up there. Okay? They're both going to give you the same zero values. Uh the graphs themselves might look just a little bit different than each other, but they still give you the same zero values. Okay? Now, something like this much much easier to deal with. 
okay and I'm not necessarily going to go through the whole process here okay but what I want you to focus on a little bit is if you don't have fractions all right, this becomes a whole lot easier negative 2 would come from x plus 2 as a factor 2 would come from x minus 2 as a factor and 4 would come from x minus 4 as a factor okay once you figure out what factors you're dealing with all right like I said this becomes relatively easy now we just foil and then you have to do some multiplication as far as taking a binomial times a trinomial okay so you want to go ahead and work that one out on your own um, you're certainly more than welcome to do so uh, give you a little extra practice and give you something that you can kind of work with a little bit as like I said once you get the factors written this becomes very similar to some of the stuff we did early in chapter 6 alright now I talked about this fact a little bit in section 5 all right, but essentially what the fundamental theorem of algebra says okay is that the highest power of your polynomial also represents the total number of roots that that polynomial happens to have now in section 5 we just focused on the real number roots okay some of them were rational you know for example like 2 negative 2 or even some fractions you know 1 half negative 1 half all rational zeros okay and then we also talked about irrational zeros uh, which would be something in the form of you know we talked about examples that had the square root of 2 or the negative square root of 2 or square root of 3 negative square root of 3 um, that were roots those are all irrational numbers but they're still real okay so what we're going to talk about here is um, the real number zeros and also the complex number zeros, the ones that have i's in them, okay, those all together have to add up to whatever the highest power of your polynomial is. Okay? And that's really what this is saying down here. The degree of your polynomial, okay? If the degree is greater than one, okay, or equal to one, um, you have at least one zero. Okay, now obviously, like I said, as the degree goes up, you should have as many zeros, total zeros, real and imaginary, as that number, or as the highest power. Okay, the key here is trying to determine how do we find the real ones, then how do we find the um, imaginary ones. Okay, now, using this same idea, okay, or using this theorem, all right, we can write any type of polynomial in factored form including all of the zeros like I said last section we just focused on the rational and irrational zeros all right but we can also work things to a point where when, when it gets down to it at the end we can figure out what the imaginary zeros are as well as long as we keep repeating that synthetic division process until we get down to some type of quadratic or something where x squared is all we have left and we can use some other method to find the zeros for that. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to take the rational root theorem, okay, where we found rational zeros, the irrational root theorem, which is essentially the same thing, but it just talks about irrational numbers, and methods for finding complex roots, um, specifically probably the quadratic formula, to find all zeros of a particular polynomial and to write um, that polynomial in factored form. So, what I'm going to look at here is, again, we're going to use graphs to really help us out here a little bit. Now, we talked about the rational root theorem in section 5 where you list all your possible um, zeros for the function based on this and the leading coefficient, okay, p and q essentially, okay. Well, if you think about all the factors of 36, okay, and technically all the factors of one, all right, we're taking p and we would be dividing it by q. All right, well, one, which is our q, just means that basically if you list all the factors of p, the 36, you would divide them all by one or negative one, so you'd end up with basically just whatever the factors of 36 are. So you're looking at, you know, plus or minus one, plus or minus two. Uh, let's see, probably a 3, plus or minus 3, um, 4 goes in there, plus or minus 4, uh, plus or minus 6, 
plus or minus 9, plus or minus 12, uh, plus or minus 18, and plus or minus 36. So there is a whole lot of options as far as what could be possible real number zeros, okay, or rational number zeros of this particular polynomial. Okay, now again, those are just the factors of p. If I divided them all by 1, because our leading coefficient is 1, representing our q, it wouldn't change anything, so that's why I'm not really worried about dividing all of them out. Okay, but this is why we use the graph. Okay, it looks like, based on this, I have two um, rational zeros, okay, and two that happen to be real numbers here. Okay, it looks like one is at negative one, which up here would be one of my options. And it looks like another one is at positive four, which positive four is one of my options. So at least that means I did the whole rational root theorem thing correctly as far as the P and Q is concerned. So I'm going to take one of those numbers. I'm going to start with negative one. All right, and I'm going to go ahead and do synthetic division. Five negative 27, negative 36. So I'm going to list all my coefficients and my constant. All right, now I'm going to go ahead and drop the 1, make this negative 1. Okay, that's going to give me negative 4. This is going to give me 4. This is going to give me 9. Uh, this is going to give me negative 9. I'm going to get positive, excuse me, negative 36. We add that, and I'm going to get positive 36 here, and a remainder of 0. Okay, so again, what that means is uh, negative 1 is a 0, meaning x plus 1 is one of my factors. Okay, and what I would have here listed, my coefficients, would be what I have left over. All right, but I'm not going to write what I have left over right now, uh, just simply for the fact that uh, it would still be x to the third, meaning I'm still going to have to do another step of synthetic division before I would be left with something that I'm actually going to be able to factor. All right, so I'm going to jump right to using this root of 4 over here. I'm going to jump right into another round of synthetic division. Okay, so drop the 1, get 4, or get 0, 0, 9, 36. Okay, and my remainder would be 0. Okay, again, so uh, 4 works, so that means x minus 4 uh, would be another factor of that particular polynomial. Okay, so negative 1 and 4 are my roots thus far. Okay, now what I have here would be what I'm left with. Okay, so x squared uh, looks like plus 0x and then plus 9. Okay, now obviously that's not factorable because it's not a difference of squares. Um, so I couldn't factor that, but what I could do to figure out zeros is I could set it equal to zero, and I could go ahead and solve for x. Now you could use the quadratic formula here, but because there's no x term, it's much easier to just say, all right, I'm going to subtract 9. x squared is going to equal negative 9. Square root, square root. Okay, that would mean I'd have to take an i out to essentially get rid of that negative. And then the square root of 9 is 3, so x is going to equal plus or minus 3i. Okay, so plus 3i and minus 3i represent my other two roots, okay, which both in both cases they would be imaginary. Okay, so um, as far as my four roots go, and that's what the question said, find all the roots. Okay, we found negative 1, we found 4, and then we basically found x equals 3i and x equals negative 3i. Okay, so all four of those would be my roots, and the key here is my highest power in my polynomial was 4, meaning I have to have four roots. Okay, so those would be all my roots. Now, as far as writing my other factors here, um, you know, I started with writing these two down. If I'm going to write these down here as factors, it's going to look something like this. You're going to have x minus 3i, okay, which would essentially give you this one. And you're going to have x plus 3i, which would give you this one down here. 
So all four of those, these two and these two up here written together consecutively would represent the full factored form of that particular polynomial. Okay, Two real number zeros, which also happen to be rational zeros, and two complex or two imaginary zeros. Okay, So like I said as we move forward with this stuff, there's kind of a lot going on here, okay? Kind of a lot going on here, and these problems tend to take a little bit of time, okay? So here's another example. I would like you to try to work this one out on your own a little bit, all right? And then we'll come back and we'll go through the whole process again uh, once you get a chance to work on that. All right, so again, the whole rational root theorem thing we talked about before, I'd be looking at factors of 20, and again, factors of 1, okay, with this being my P and this being my Q. So I would take all the factors of P and divide them by all the factors of Q. All right, well, in this case, Q being 1 again makes things really, really easy, or at least much easier than it would normally be, okay? So what we're looking at here is my factors of 20 would be plus or minus 1, plus or minus 2, plus or minus 4. 4, uh, plus or minus 5, plus or minus 10, and plus or minus 20. Okay, now again, you would technically supposed to take all of those and divide them by Q, which you divide them all by plus or minus 1. You're going to get everything that's already there. So those are my possible um, rational roots that I would have. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and try to find all the roots here. Um, it looks like over here that might be close to 1, but it doesn't necessarily look like it intersects exactly at 1. So what we're probably looking at here uh, would be something along the lines of an irrational number right there. So we're not going to start with that. This one over here on the left uh, looks a little more cut and dry. It looks like it would be at negative 1, 2, 3, 4, negative 5. So why don't we start with negative 5 as my um, first number I use in synthetic division. Okay, um, So we'll write our coefficients for negative 1, 16, negative 20. Okay, and again, remember it's super important to make sure you get the correct signs on all your coefficients. Uh, otherwise, that will throw off your, your answer a little bit as we go here. So kind of buzz through this quick or negative 20 to 4 20 0 okay so again what that's telling us right now is negative 5 is a 0 so that means that we're probably looking at x plus 5 as a factor so we know negative 5 is one of my roots or one of my zeros Okay, now, again, because we'd still be left with x to the third, if I'm thinking about my, my uh, coefficients on the bottom, as far as what I would have left if I technically divide by a negative 5, um, anything to the third like that, um, it, I'm going to go ahead and write here what I have left actually this time around. x to the third uh, minus x squared plus 4x minus Four. Okay. Now, technically, what we would probably most times try to do here is we'd try to say, all right, it looks like there's another spot where we cross the, the x-axis um, where we have a, you know, a real number or a rational number where it goes right through there. Uh, my guess would be this time around we're probably looking at one as an option, although like I said, you can't always tell from the graph whether that goes right through one. So we can go ahead and try one. Uh, I just wanted to make sure I wrote down what we have left. Technically here, if you look at that, you could probably group that and factor it as well. Uh, so if you wanted to go that route, but usually, you know, another round of synthetic division is your best bet. Let's think about um, go ahead and using one this time because it looks like the graph uh, it looks like the graph probably intersects somewhere around there. So I'll just get rid of this stuff. Maybe I won't get rid of that stuff. There it goes. 
Okay, so we'll get rid of this stuff and we'll try synthetic division again. Now, if we don't get synthetic division to work out, that means that the uh, the number right here is probably not a real number. All right, but I think we'll be okay. Uh, and again, those graphs can be tricky, so sometimes it's just a matter of you got to try and see what you come up with. Okay, so drop the one, I get one, zero, zero, four, four. All right, and it does work out. So one would be another factor, okay, meaning, or excuse me, another zero, meaning x minus one would be another factor. Now, let's take a look at what we're left with again here. It's like x squared because of this one, zero x, all right, plus four. All right, so very similar situation to what we had the last time around. Okay, we're going to set it equal to zero. It's not complicated enough or complex enough to the point where we really actually have to use uh, the quadratic formula. So I'm going to subtract the 4. x squared is going to equal negative 4 square root. Uh, we'd put an i out front and get rid of the negative. And then the square root of 4 would be 2. So x is going to equal plus or minus 2i. Okay, so again, that would account for my other two roots. Okay, one being 2i and one being negative 2i. Okay, so now that I got that taken care of, uh, I could go ahead and write my other two factors here, which is going to be x minus 2i and x plus 2i. Okay, so again, just something else that we can kind of do here to figure out our roots and figure out our factors. Again, we have four roots now, okay, which the fundamental theorem of algebra tells us we should have four because our highest power is four. Okay, we're just adding another um, means to kind of finding everything that we got going on. All right. Now, like I said before, maybe now would be a good time to take a break if you haven't already taken a break. Um, and you should be able to work through a fair amount of your assignment um, based on what we've talked about already. Okay. Now, there's a couple other things that we're going to discuss here. Uh, like right here, this kind of goes back to one of the first things we did. We we're supposed to write something you know, the simplest function or the simplest form of a polynomial that would have these roots or these zeros, okay? So what we're looking at with this right here is, you'll notice that we have um, an irrational number there, and we also have a complex number here, okay? So the important thing to remember here is, one, complex answers come in pairs or conjugate pairs. So if 2 plus i is a root or a zero, that means 2 minus i is also a root or zero. And with the square root of 3, we talked about this a little bit last time too, irrational numbers also come in pairs. So if negative 3, or excuse me, if the square root of 3 is a zero, that means negative square root of 3 is also a zero. So essentially, if you remember how complex numbers work, or complex zeros work, and how irrational zeros work, all right, you know that if you're given one of those, technically you're given two zeros or two roots uh, that go ahead and make this work. Okay, so um, the next thing that we'd probably be looking at here is going ahead and trying to figure out how all this is going to look when we write it. Okay, so first I'm going to start with the 1 because that's probably the easiest. If 1 is a 0, that means x minus 1 is a 0. Okay, the next thing here would be we want to go ahead and we want to try to figure out what else we could write here. So why don't we go ahead and say we'll look at the imaginary numbers here first. So 2 plus i that means we would have had x minus, and I'm going to kind of put another parenthesis in here so you can keep this straight. Okay, and then I'm going to have x minus 2 minus i. All right, and then I would go ahead and want to include my irrational numbers. So x minus the square root of 3, x plus the square root of 3. Now, all of that together, okay, would go, it would basically represent what I'm looking at here as far as a factored form for this particular equation. Okay, now the thing that I want to keep in mind here is technically you can still go ahead 
and you can factor all this stuff, or not factor all this stuff, foil all this stuff, and work towards um, getting an actual polynomial that gave you this whole thing. Okay, the thing that does get to be a little bit confusing, okay, obviously foiling this stuff over here wouldn't be that much of an issue. You'd end up with some square roots in there, all right, but it wouldn't be the end of the world. The big thing is, I'm sure we probably look at this part in here, and we're like, how in the world do you go ahead and get all that stuff to work? Okay, well, there's probably a couple of different methods you could use for that. Um, if you remember that i is equal to the square root of negative 1, you could probably replace it if you wanted to. Or if you remember that how i squared work uh, works, we could probably make that happen too. Uh, it's just one of those things where it does require a little bit of work to go ahead and get through this point. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start over here uh, with the whole x minus square root of 3, x plus square root of 3. Okay, so x and x obviously gives me x squared. Okay, I'm going to have x plus, okay, x plus, excuse me, plus x times the square root of 3, and this is going to give me minus x square root of 3. So essentially those are going to fall out. So what I'll be left with is negative square root of 3 times the positive square root of 3. So think about it. Square root of 3 times the square root of 3 would give you 9. Square root of 9 is 3. Different sign, so minus 3 would get me right there. Okay. Now, the thing about the rest of this is, all right, the x minus 1, go ahead and multiplying that in there, that's not going to be a real huge issue either. We can foil this pretty easy. We'll come back to this part here in a second. So x and x. It's going to give me, or x times x squared is going to be x to the third. This is going to give me negative 3x. This gives me negative x squared. This gives me plus 3. Okay. Now I could technically probably write that in what would be standard form. Okay. x squared uh, minus 3x plus 3. All right. So this takes care of the irrational part and the real number part. Okay. Now in the middle here, Remember, it looks a little bit more confusing than it really is. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and we're going to multiply this stuff and just kind of see what happens. So if I go ahead and take this times that, right, I'm going to say I have x negative x times 2 minus i. I'm just going to leave it like that for right now. Okay, then we're going to go this, excuse me, I did that. Outer, I should have done the first first. Okay, so that would technically be x squared. I'll go ahead and write that in front. So first, outer, we already did that. Okay, now the inner. Okay, this is going to give me minus, okay, minus x is 2 plus i. All right, then the last terms together, I would take this times this. All right, which technically we would get a plus and we would essentially have 2 plus i times 2 minus i. I know that got kind of scribbly in there. I ran out of room. All right. Now, I didn't necessarily go through and work everything together, okay? But you kind of get the general idea of how this is supposed to work, okay? So now let's think about here the 2 plus i times the 2 minus i, okay? Essentially, it looks like a difference of squares, but the 2 times 2 would give you 4. Uh, we would get negative 2i plus 2i, so those are gone. Minus i squared when you take the last two times each other. So negative i squared would be like negative, negative 1. So it kind of just be like plus 1. So essentially, that whole part's going to give you 5. When you do all this in here, which again, I kind of got a little scribbly together there. All right, but essentially, that right there, if you were to foil it, is going to give you 5. All right, so this part is all gone and out of there. Okay, now taking a look at this stuff in the middle. Okay, if you distribute, you would get negative 2x uh, plus xi or ix, however you want to write it. Here we would get negative 2x um, minus ix. So you can see how this and this are going to cancel each other out. So basically, I end up getting a negative 4x out of that whole deal. 
and then I have the x squared that's in the front. Okay. Now, a lot of work. We're definitely going to go through one of those in class to make sure that everybody understands what happens when you start multiplying all that stuff together. Now, I wouldn't be all the way done yet because I have this that I would have to multiply by this. So you can see how that's going to end up being a somewhat long process because right? you still have to do a lot of multiplying left to get to your answer. Now, again, that just goes back to the whole thing I talked about as far as um, you need to make sure all right, that you give yourself ample time to complete these. And that's why your assignment and stuff doesn't include a whole lot of uh, homework problems because the process does take so long. So again, hopefully you kind of followed through that. I know there's a lot going on. Um, it's going to be one of those that we definitely make sure we take the time to go over in class because you really have to kind of think a little bit when we start doing all the multiplication and stuff and the simplifying with that imaginary section. All right. Here's another example uh, just for time's sake. Uh, it does provide you something if you want to try to go through another one on your own and work it out. Um, this will probably be one of those that we discuss in class specifically. Um, but just to kind of get you started, remember, if 2i is a 0, that means negative 2i is also a 0. And if 1 plus the square root of 2 is a 0, that means 1 minus the square root of 2 is also a 0. Okay, so again, you're going to have 5 in this particular case. All right, so at least that should help you get started if you can kind of remember what we talked about as far as the last one goes. Okay, that would mean x minus 3 is a factor x minus 2i would be a 0. That would mean x, and it would be technically minus a negative 2i would be a 0, which that's going to end up becoming a plus. All right, and then we have x minus 1 plus the square root of 2. And then we would have x plus 1 or excuse me, it should be x minus again. Excuse me, they're always x minus with the irrational. x minus 1 minus the square root of 2. So those would be your factors. Um, it maybe wouldn't be a, a bad idea for you to maybe try to go ahead and multiply that stuff together and see what you come up with. But again, it's something that we'll discuss a little bit more in class. Now, I pretty much have one thing left here I want to talk about as far as the story problem goes. Um, the story problems really themselves aren't that bad. Uh, again, it's one of those things where we're talking about the same stuff uh, that we talked about uh, when we were just doing the normal problems in the assignment. Okay, so we're going to take that and we're going to apply it to what we have going on here. So this says a silo is in the shape of a cylinder with a cone-shaped top. The cylinder is 20 feet tall. The height of the cone is one and a half times the radius. The volume of the silo is 828 pi cubic feet. Find the radius. So essentially what you're looking at right here is you don't know what your radius is, so your radius is equal to x. Okay. Now I listed the important information on the bottom down here. Uh, you know that your height of the cylinder is 20 feet tall. Uh, the height of the cone is going to be one and a half times the radius, and we don't know the radius, so we'd say 1.5x. And the volume is going to equal... Uh, the total volume equals 28, uh, 828 pi cubic feet. Now, it might seem like there's a lot going on here. Okay. Um, if you need to kind of take a break and get away from this and then maybe come back and look at it here in a little bit, I would encourage you to do so. Okay. Um, so what we're looking at here is essentially to find the total volume, we would have to find the volume of the cylinder, and then we'd have to find the volume of the cone and add those together, and those should equal the whole 828 pi cubic feet. Now, I'm sure you probably don't remember how the whole volume thing works, so I wrote these formulas up here for you. Okay, so the volume of a cone is going to be one third pi radius squared times the height, and the volume of the cylinder is going to be pi radius squared times the height. Now, remember, we don't know the radius, we said the radius is going to be equal to x right now. So, if I want to find the volume of the cone, all right, which would go right here, because remember, it's 828 pi, all right, that's going to equal whatever the volume of the cone is. So I'd have to say one-third pi, okay? Uh, we don't know what the radius is, so we're going to say x squared, because x is in place of the r. We called what we're trying to find x. 
and then the height. Okay, well the height is 1.5x. Okay, and instead of putting 1.5x for the sake of what I have going on here, I'm actually going to write 3 halves x. All right, because it'll make sense here in a minute why I did that. Okay, plus the volume of the cylinder. Okay, so the cylinder is going to be pi. Again, we called our x, and then the height is going to be 20. Okay, so let's kind of simplify what we have going on here. I'm going to go ahead and take this and write it on the other side. Okay, but the reason I put the 3 over 2 in here is if I multiply, technically the 3's would cancel. So I could just say I actually have 1 half pi and then x times x squared would give me x to the third. So that simplifies that first part plus 20. All right, plus 20 pi x squared, and that's supposed to equal 828 pi. Now, the tough part about this is just making sure you get your setup, and all your problems are going to be based on the same thing a cone and a cylinder type setup where you're going to have to do this. Okay, now if we actually want to solve anything, we have to set equal to zero. Okay, because what we're trying to do is we're trying to go ahead and figure out uh, what my radius is going to be. Okay, and basically what that's going to do is it's going to uh, equate to the zero, the zero point of this function. So I'm going to take this and I'm going to subtract it over. So one half pi x to the third plus twenty pi x squared minus eight twenty eight pi is equal to zero. Okay. Now before we go any further, you'll notice that they all have a pi in common. So I'm going to divide that out and I'm going to get rid of it. So you can make it look like you factored it out. Uh, x to the third plus 20. X minus 8. 28 is equal to 0. Factored out, but technically you don't really even need it anymore if we're solving this. So what I have left would be this inside part. Now, we would graph it. Okay, we would go ahead and graph it. And what we're looking for here is... And this is just showing what we had and then what happens after we take the pi out, what we'd have left. Okay, and down here is the graph of everything that's going on. Now, from this point forward, you would approach this problem in the exact same way that you approached everything else. Okay, look at the graph. Where does it look like your zeros are? Okay, well, it looks like I have one over here and one over here. You could go through the whole process of the whole P and Q thing like we've done before as far as the rational root theorem is concerned. All right. But I would say in this case, because you have a lot of possibilities with 828 and 1 half, look at the graph. It looks like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. All right. 6, I think, would be your best starting point. Remember, we don't really want to worry about this one on the left because it's negative and you can't have a negative radius. So let's focus on the 6. Okay, so what you would do is use synthetic division with the 6 uh, and try to narrow things down a little bit. Okay, and the other thing about that is after you use the 6 just to prove uh, using synthetic division that it is a root, is 6 is technically going to be your answer. All right, you're going to have some type of leftover after you do synthetic division that's still going to be x squared and something like that. But if you look at the graph, you're only going to have two real number roots, okay? You're only going to have two real number roots coming from something that started as x to the third, which means that other root is imaginary, so that's not going to help you out at all as far as your answer is concerned. So essentially what's going to happen, do synthetic division with 6. After you get all the way down and prove that your remainder is 0, that means 6 is the answer you're looking for. 6 is equal to x. x equals your radius. So you found your answer. Okay. Now, again, it takes time. I, I'm hoping that you split things up into um, into some groups here a little bit and didn't try to do everything at the same time. Um, it's one of those things where, again, we're just kind of adding another step to everything that we've been doing and trying to take things and put them in the big picture. We're probably going to spend a little time on this section just simply because it's a section that is probably one of the most important ones you'll look at in Algebra 2. Okay, it helps pull everything together that we've talked about for the whole year. Okay, so I know you're going to have some questions. You need to make sure you ask those questions, probably outside of class. Um, 
and in class when we have the opportunity to do so. But make sure if you don't know, you ask. Okay? Otherwise, there's a lot of information in the video. Uh, just remember, you're going to have to put some work into this as far as looking at the video, looking at the notes and examples you've been provided, and also looking at the notes and stuff um, that you're coming up with on your own. Okay? You're going to have to put some work into this, okay? Because it's going to be, it's a long process. All right? You need to make sure that you know what you're doing as you go through this. And again, if you have questions and stuff when you go through this, you need to make sure that you ask.